Hello, and welcome to the National Archives Foundation's virtual program series. I'm Patrick Madden, the Executive Director of the Foundation, and we're delighted to have you here this afternoon. Through this foundation programming, we're pleased to open up the doors and all the treasure of the National Archives, more than 15 billion records, through these spirited conversations. I'm delighted to host a fantastic program on the First Ladies today. And just so you know, our speakers today are fantastic. They are going to answer your questions after they make their presentation. So we wanna make sure you're engaged throughout and you know how to ask your questions. So we'll be using the YouTube chat, uh, which is on the right side of your screen in case you haven't been to one of our programs before. And I can see we've got a lot of friends who are visiting again, add your hometown and your state now as a way to practice. And I might give you a shout out later on in the program. Well, let's jump right in. We've got a lot to hear about uh, an important topic of First Ladies, but also something we don't really talk a lot about, which is their role in engaging around civil rights and, and justice issues. So let me talk to you a little bit about who our speakers are today, and we're gonna jump right in. Um, Anita McBride is an executive in residence at American University in Washington, DC. Uh, she directs the First Ladies Initiative. She's known to many of you because she was the second term chief of staff for Laura Bush. She served in the White House and the Department of State for George W. Bush. Um, she's also served in the administrations of George H.W. Bush and Ronald Reagan, and is the founding member of the First Ladies Association for Research and Education, also known as FLAIR. Our second speaker today, uh, Nancy Keegan Smith, is the FLAIR Vice President. She was an archivist at the National Archives and Records Administration, starting at the LBJ Presidential Library and Museum, and then worked at the archives here in DC from 1973 to 2012, where she retired as the Director of Presidential Materials Division. She currently, currently lectures and writes on the First Ladies, including Lady Bird Johnson and Michelle Obama, and is co-editor of Modern First Ladies, their documentary Legacy. She's also published articles on presidential libraries and access to presidential records. And our last speaker, who will also be our first speaker, is Diana Carlin. She's the Flair Treasurer, is Professor Emerita of Communication at St. Louis University, and is a retired faculty member and administrator of the University of Kansas, where she taught a course on the rhetoric of first ladies. She currently teaches Osher lifelong learning classes on first ladies and lectures on their influence. She is the co-author or author of books on chapters books and chapters on uh, Martha Washington, Barbara Bush, Lady Bird Johnson, Hillary Clinton, and Michelle Obama. Diana, you're going to kick it off today. Are you with us? I am with you, Patrick. Thank Terrific. you. Terrific. Well, we're excited to have you. I know you've got a great presentation for us, so I am going to pass the screen to you and let you get started. Okay, thank you. And good evening, everyone. And thank you for joining my friends, Anita and Nancy and me. Well, we share some first lady history on this last day of Women's History Month. As the program description indicated, this presentation and previously an opinion piece that the three of us wrote for CNN last summer were inspired by events surrounding George Floyd's death and responses from first ladies, Mel Melania Trump and former first ladies, Hillary Clinton and Michelle Obama. Nancy, Anita, and I really saw their comments as a demonstration of the type of leadership First Ladies often take in times of national crisis. Our work as First Lady Scholar attempts to show that First Ladies are involved in far more than hosting state dinners or being fashion icons, even though both of those have both soft power and rhetorical power. Most of our First Ladies from the very beginning were very astute political actors who either found ways to participate within the confines of their particular time, or they decided to challenge those times and lead. So first ladies have contributed to the public good in many ways. And we all know looking at these women up here, especially the modern first ladies, some of the causes that they've taken on. When it comes to civil rights, the history goes back really to the first days of the Republic. To better appreciate the activist roles of the modern first ladies that Nancy and Anita are going to talk about, starting with Elizabeth, Eleanor Roosevelt, my role is to provide some historical perspective that makes these modern first ladies' public involvement in civil rights even more extraordinary. The relationship between first ladies and civil rights has a checkered past, starting with our first presidential couple, George and Martha Washington. 
They brought their enslaved servants with them to New York and Philadelphia, the two first capitals while Washington was being built. Martha's actions were then followed by six other first ladies and we had a total of nine presidential administrations in which enslaved servants were brought to the White House. Washington's went so far as to circumvent laws in order to have their enslaved servants in the president's house. When the capital was moved from New York to Philadelphia, the Washingtons were confronted with a law that said that any enslaved person brought into the city would be freed after six months of residence. Well, everyone turned a blind eye while the Washingtons shuttled their enslaved servants between Mount Vernon and Philadelphia to avoid uh, having to free them. The White House Historical Association, as Anita is going to talk about later, looked at this history of White House and slavery. And what that history shows us is that it's impossible to overlook the fact that our founding fathers and mothers contributed to the systemic racism that resulted in multiple African-American deaths last year and touched off last summer's marches and protests. One early first lady, however, took a very different view of the institution of slavery from that of her good friend Martha, and that was Abigail Adams. She was an abolitionist, and this statement makes her position clear. How could they, the Southerners, reconcile human bondage with the ideology of freedom that Americans had fought for? Now, unfortunately, her voice was that of a minority voice given the dominance of Southern slaveholding presidents in our early history. But Abigail did put her words into practice in her own life. The Massachusetts Historical Society has the papers of John and Abigail Adams. And in those papers is a letter that Abigail wrote to John in February of 1797, shortly before he was sworn in as president. And she was telling him about an incident involving a free African-American who she referred to as James, who was a paid employee of the Adams. Uh, he tended to agricultural matters at their farm. Abigail personally taught him reading and writing and fought for him to attend a local school. When a neighbor objected, she responded to the neighbor with this question. Is this the Christian principle of doing to others as we would have others do to us? Now, as one would expect when directly confronting the indomitable Abigail Adams, the neighbor backed down. Just as Abigail, however, was not heard in her pleas to remember the ladies, her calls for the new nation to follow Christian principles in terms of enslaving other humans fell on deaf ears. After Abigail, we didn't see support for African-Americans freedom until Mary Todd Lincoln. Mary grew up in a family of slaves. She personally saw the evils of slavery and some of her, uh, some of her relatives did free their slaves. Her letters don't outright speak to her support of racial equality, but what her papers do show us is that she demonstrated a support for emancipation. Mary was vilified by both the South for having been a Southerner who defected to the North and by the North that didn't trust her. But her loyalties were definitely to the Union cause and in a larger sense, but also to the emancipated men and women who would face very difficult times as they went from being enslaved to free, to free people. During the White House years, her dressmaker, Elizabeth Cackley, who was a free black woman, made her aware of the plight of individuals who had run away from the South uh, during the, the Civil War, especially after the Emancipation Proclamation. And Mary personally contributed her funds to the Contraband Relief Association to help these men and women settle into their new lives. Mary also wrote letters of recommendation for former slaves who were applying for government jobs, including Elizabeth Keckley. And after her husband's death, she wrote of the Emancipation Proclamation that it was a legacy from her husband to her sons. Between the end of the Civil War and Eleanor Roosevelt, four other first ladies demonstrated support for equal rights. Lucy Hayes, who's well known for her temperance stance, uh, was an abolitionist and a suffragist before the Civil War. She encouraged her lawyer husband, Rutherford, to defend runaway slaves who had left Kentucky for Ohio. And as First Lady from 1877 to 91, she was concerned with the plight of both African Americans and Native Americans. And she personally funded a scholarship for a Native American woman and assisted an African American woman in her admission to Oberlin College. She invited the first African American professional musician to perform in the White House. That was Marie Silkham Williams, a soprano, who was introduced by Frederick Douglass. 
She also invited other black musician groups, including students to sing at White House events. Another for early or first lady was Helly, Helen Nellie Taft, who developed an appreciation for cultural and racial diversity when her husband was serving as president of the commission to establish a civil government in the Philippines. And then he served as governor general of the Philippines. She used social events, uh, as I said, they can have rhetorical power uh, to chip away at the color line that was left over from the previous military government by inviting Filipinos along with Americans and Europeans to social events that she and, uh, and her husband hosted. She was described by one biographer as being egalitarian and she made sure that African-Americans and immigrants were invited to the White House events and she expanded employment opportunities for African-Americans on the White House staff. She believed that education was a great equalizer and she supported kindergarten classes for black children. Well, she's best known for bringing the cherry trees to Washington her lesser known civil rights actions were impactful beyond dist on the district's boundaries. Ellen Wilson, Woodrow Wilson's wife, was a Southerner whose ancestors had also owned slaves. While her tenure as First Lady was br brief due to illness and her death, she made an important contribution to improving housing in the district. Through her work with the National Civic Federation Women's Division, she supported construction of affordable housing to replace the housing that was in alleyways that was being occupied by many of the city's African-American and immigrant populations. She even invested in the company that built the housing and she supported with that investment until her death. Prior to her illness uh, prohibiting her from leaving the White House, she took members of Congress and city leaders to the alleys where these individuals were living in squalor and she encouraged them to pass legislation to do something about this housing. In many ways, she established the beginning of the modern First Lady's activism by directly focusing on legislative issues and leaving the White House to show policymakers what it was they needed to be dealing with. And finally, Lou Henry Hoover, uh, who was a trailblazer in many ways. She furthered integration at the White House activities, once again, through a social event by hosting a tea party, but a tea party with very serious civil rights implications. When the country's first 20th century African-American congressman, Oscar Stanton de Priest, who was a Republican from Illinois, arrived in DC, the usual social invitations didn't follow for him and his wife. Mrs. Hoover's staff, wrote a memo to the president's secretary for suggestions on how to provide a welcoming environment for the DePriest during their tenure in Washington. What resulted was an invitation to Jesse DePriest to attend a White House tea, which was a common practice for Mrs. Hoover for members, wives of members of Congress and captain and, and so forth. She made it smaller than most of them and she only invited women who she knew would treat Mrs. DePriest with respect and, and with the courtesies that the position she and her husband held really represented. She was the first, Mrs. DePriest was the first African-American invited to the White House in 28 years with Booker T. Washington being the previous one by the Roosevelt administration. The invitation was intended by the Hoovers and Congressman DePriest to spur African-American political activism. Hoover won several states and they knew this was going to rankle people, but the Hoovers took the long view and they went ahead and did it. They received incredible public criticism, the vitriolic letters, vitriolic editorials. And I highly recommend Annette B. Dunlap's excellent 2015 article in Prologue about the DePriest Tea Party invitation that shows you what they went through after this invitation. But Hoover stood by his wife and he then invited the presidents of Hampton Institute and Tuskegee Institute, historically black colleges to the White House. While Mary Lincoln and these later four women didn't face the challenges that the women Nancy and Anita will discuss, they did lay the groundwork for civil rights activism by first ladies. So with that, I'm now gonna turn it over to Nancy to discuss Eleanor Roosevelt. Hello, I'm pleased to be here today. And I would like to thank Patrick Madden, the head of the foundation and Gneil McDonald the Senior Director for Special Events for all they have done to make this program possible and the support of the National Archives Foundation. 
I would also like to thank the Archivist of the United States, David Ferriero, whose agency holds the records of all first ladies' papers from Lou Henry Hoover to Michelle Obama in the presidential libraries. Today, I am very pleased to be talking on two very special first ladies, Eleanor Roosevelt and Lady Bird Johnson, and the incredibly effective advances they tried to make for civil rights issues in, in spite of the fact that they both encountered death threats. Eleanor Roosevelt consistently fought racial discrimination and prejudice, and in fact was a stronger advocate than her husband. Just a few examples of what she did included joining and addressing the 1936 annual NAACP and National Urban League conferences, advocating for any lynching legislation and supporting multiple anti-segregation campaigns, co-chairing the National Committee to Abolish the Poll Tax, which was uh, uh, against, it was a penalty to African-Americans and convening the first national conference of Negro women at the White House. For these, she suffered a death threat, uh, many, but the KKK specifically put a bounty on her head. In commenting on what Eleanor Roosevelt's support for African-Americans meant, a prominent African-American journalist, Verdon Jordan, mentioned an important quality when he said, most black people were struck with the genuineness and the feeling that she was for real, not only the so-called sympathetic statements. She showed empathy and appeared to be thoroughly convinced that America could not live up to its promise of being a democracy unless it did something about the racial problem in this country. Next slide, please. She had an incredible event occur, which uh, caused the biggest civil rights event uh, on the mall uh, before the I Dream speech. What happened was in 1939, Marian Anderson was going to appear and perform at Constitutional Hall. She was a world famous opera singer. And the Daughters of the American Revolution owned the hall and they uh, would not permit an African American to sing at Constitution Hall. So Eleanor Roosevelt resigned saying, I am in complete disagreement with the attitude taken in refusing Constitutional Hall to a great artist. You have set an example, which seems to me unfortunate, and I feel obligated to send in to you my resignation. You had an opportunity to lead in an enlightened way, and it seems to me that your organization has failed. Next slide, please. Instead of having failure, Eleanor Roosevelt worked with Franklin Roosevelt's Secretary of the Interior, Harold Dickies, and they arranged for Marian Anderson to sing on the mall in front of the Lincoln Memorial. And as it went, as the planning went forward, Marian Anderson the night before wasn't even sure she wanted to do this but it ended up being incredible. 75,000 people showed up. So if we can play that video, please. Genius, genius draws no color line. And so it is fitting that Marian Anderson should raise her voice in tribute to the noble Lincoln whom mankind will ever honor. Miss Marion Anderson.
Wow, that last face of a man you saw was that of Justice Hugo Black. And it this segment shows how important a social event can sometimes be in advancing civil rights. It was just an incredible event. Can we move forward now to the Lady Bird Johnson whistle stop? I am picking Whistle Stop to show Lady Bird Johnson on civil rights because she called it one of the most dramatic days in my political career. It was a historic campaign. It was the first time a first lady campaigned on her own. Uh, it was planned by three women, Liz Carpenter, her press secretary, Lady Bird Johnson, and Beth Sable, her social secretary, along with the chair, uh, Congresswoman Lindy Boggs, all of whom were from the South at a time when women did not plan political events like this. The time period of the train trip occurred from October 6th to the 9th, 1964. It occurred at a very dangerous time in history because in July of 1964, President Johnson had passed the Civil Rights Act and the Johnsons from their Southern friends were getting a huge outcry over this. The Secret Service was afraid for President Johnson to go in the South. And there were many threats if they came down to the South. But Mrs. Johnson was determined she called the trip a journey of the heart, saying, I have a strong sentimental family deep tied to the South. And I thought the South was getting a bad rap from the nation and indeed the world. It was painted as a bastion of ignorance and all sorts of ugly things. It was my country. And although no, I knew I couldn't be that persuasive to them, at least I could talk to them in a language they would understand. The message she brought was the New South needed to throw off the yoke of racism and move forward. She effectively used media along with daughters Linda and Lucy and President Johnson joined her at three stops. The train was originally only supposed to have 55 reporters but was packed with 225. She traveled over 1,600 miles, making 47 speeches in four days. The trip was a great success, credited with helping Lyndon win three Southern states in 1964 at a time when it had been feared Southern Democrats would bolt the party. And it was estimated that over 500,000 people heard her message. And with national TV coverage, she elevated and encouraged the support and implementation of civil rights with great courage and great calmness. Next slide. We're gonna hear a little bit of Lady Bird Johnson's thoughts from her diary on the Whistle Stop campaign. Can we now, in this decade, and in thinking, there is a drawing apart of the South from the national life. And every time the rest of the nation makes one more snide joke about corn pone. As a final stop in New Orleans, Mrs. Johnson's last speech she made a comment that was so very relevant for today. And it's eerily relevant. She said, we're testing as a nation whether we shall move forward with an understanding of each other or whether we shall move backward. This is, I believe, a contest between the positive and the negative. And she said that in 1964. So having said that, I turn the next pan part of the panel over to my very good friend, Anita McBride and colleague, and I'm sure we'll have an excellent presentation. Terrific, thank you.
Thank you so much, Nancy. And of course, thank you to the uh, National Archives Foundation for sponsoring this event tonight and giving me and Nancy and Diana an opportunity um, to share stories about the important stories about First Ladies and their impact on civil rights in our nation. I'm here to talk to you about Barbara Bush, Laura Bush, and Michelle Obama. And with Barbara Bush made the decision to focus on literacy while she was on a run in Memorial Park in Houston in 1980 after the presidential campaign. Coming into the White House as second lady, she wanted to do something that could help people. And what she believed if as more people could read and write and acquire the basic skills necessary to navigate the world with dignity, and achieve the greatest possible opportunity in their lives, then so too could more of the world's problems be solved. She was instrumental in the passage of the National Literacy Act of 1991 and the establishment of the National Institute of Literacy to track the disparities across the country. In her words, the National Literacy Act put into policy my belief that education is a civil right, no matter one's age. Indeed, she had a particular focus on adult literacy, believing their needs were so often overlooked and that it lies at the core of multi-generational cycles of poverty and its consequences, poor health, food insecurity, housing insecurity, civil rights issues which have enormous potential to improve the social and economic well being of families, communities, and our nation as a whole. The founder of the National Center for Family Learning said, and I quote, it was a hidden secret in this country until Barbara Bush elevated it. She launched, Barbara Bush later launched the Barbara Bush Foundation for Family Literacy in 1989 a public charity now headquartered in Washington, DC, that is laser focused on breaking the cycle of low literacy through technology innovation, mentoring, and research. The next slide, please. To Barbara Bush, illiteracy was also a part of the ignorance on AIDS, a cause that she threw right into the spotlight in March 22, 1989, two months into the new presidential administration. She visited grandma's house, a group home in Washington DC for abandoned babies and young children who had been diagnosed with HIV AIDS. There she held and hugged baby Donovan, who you see here, who had been crying uncontrollably when she entered the facility that day. And she scooped him up in her arms and he was soothed and had stopped crying. That day, without saying a word, Barbara Bush made her point. It was safe to hold a baby infected with HIV or to hug an adult with AIDS or to go to school and work alongside someone with the disease. The co-founders of Grandma's House, who you see here, said Barbara Bush impacted the whole world with publicly releasing that photo. Next slide, please, on Laura Bush. Laura Bush is best known for her lifelong advocacy of literacy and education reform. Books for her hold a sense of wonder. And as a child, books were an, escaped, an escape from her isolated hometown in Midland, Texas. But she recognized that literacy and education are more than an escape into a faraway world. They are a means by which children can overcome obstacles and thrive. As First Lady of Texas and of the United States, she advocated for education as a civil right for every child, but she had seen the importance of it long before. Laura Bush came of age as a turbulent civil rights era was beginning, graduating from the all white Robert E. Lee High School in 1964 and seeing the images on TV of the Alabama marches and the cities of Detroit and Newark in flames. This ignited in her a wish to foster change. 
She became a teacher and a librarian in inner city minority schools, and her eyes were open to a part of the world she had not seen in segregated Midland. She carries with her a memory from a field trip she planned for her fourth grade class in Houston. When she went to pick up one of her students, he came to the door, but his mother would neither come to the door nor give her permission for him to get on the bus. Laura Bush never forgot the look on that little boy's face, a haunting face-to-face -face encounter with a child who did not have a chance to experience life and learn. As First Lady of Texas, she convened a summit of experts to explore family literacy and the ways in which young children are prepared for lifelong learning. The summit contributed to sweeping education reforms in Texas. Once in the White House, she was a leading advocate for education reform and soon held a summit on early childhood cognitive development, later briefing the Congress on the summit findings and its recommendations. She launched the National Book Festival that still continues and held a series of literacy events in the White House called the Salute to America's Authors. The, the 2002 gathering celebrated writers of one of the richest literary and cultural periods in US history, the Harlem Renaissance. Laura Bush noted in her opening remarks that these men and women celebrated their culture and poetry and prose while capturing the stark realities of being black in America. At the State of the Union in February, 2005, President Bush announced a new interagency initiative focused on the growing number of boys dropping out of school and more broadly on youth at risk. And he asked First Lady Laura Bush to lead it. One of the first programs she visited was Homeboy Industries in Los Angeles, site of the largest gang intervention program in the nation. At the time, Los Angeles County was home to 1,100 gangs with an estimated 86,000 gang members. If a gang intervention program has a 30% success rate, it is considered effective. Homeboy Industries success rate is 80%. She later invited Homeboy's founder, Father Gregory Boyle, to a conference she held on youth at risk at Howard University. Father Boyle brought some of his ex-gang members with him. It was their first plane trip and the first time they had ever worn a suit. After the conference, she invited them to a reception at the White House. With that invitation, she said, young men who had been in gang fights and had even spent time in jail could learn that having started down the path to change their lives, they were welcome in the most prominent home in the nation. Next slide, please. Michelle Obama. Our nation's first African-American first lady is a descendant of slaves and her life mirrored a changing American society that had made advances for civil rights but also demonstrated the ongoing struggle for equality and the American dream. Like Barbara Bush and Laura Bush before her, Michelle Obama addressed disparities in education, but she could talk to young black Americans with a voice of authenticity that they were willing to hear. It was their voice too, and she, that she had experienced what they had experienced. She often spoke of her own example of being told by a high school guidance counselor that she wasn't good enough to go to an Ivy League school. Michelle Obama later attended Princeton and Harvard and her journey set an example of what could be achieved. In a high school commencement speech in Topeka, Kansas in 2014, commemorating the Brown versus Board of Education decision Obama spoke emphatic, emphatically about the struggle of civil rights activists to desegregate their children's schools by going all the way to the Supreme Court. It was the principle of integration that they fought for. And she reminded those students to not take that decision for granted because these issues are still being decided every day in how we live our lives. 
If we can please listen to the clip of her remarks. When it comes to getting an education, too many of our young people just can't be bothered. Today, instead of walking miles every day to school, they're sitting on couches for hours, playing video games, watching TV. Instead of dreaming of being a teacher or a lawyer or a business leader, they're fantasizing about being a baller or a rapper. Right now, right now, one in three African-American students are dropping out of high school. Only one in five African-Americans between the ages of 25 and 29 has gotten a college degree. One in five. But let's be very clear, today, getting an education is as important, if not more important, than it was back when this university was founded. As my husband has said often, please stand up and reject the slander that says a black child with a book is trying to act white. Reject that. In short, be an example of excellence for the next generation and do everything you can to help them understand the power and purpose of a good education. Michelle Obama inspired change in other profound ways too, helping the nation understand its complicated past and the relationship between slavery and freedom. In her primetime speech at the 2016 Democratic National Convention in Philadelphia, Michelle Obama said, I wake up every morning in a house built by slaves. Her words focus public attention on the history of enslaved persons in the White House, and it crashed the website of the White House Historical Association with people looking for more information. Her convention remarks resulted in a multi-year research initiative by the White House Historical Association unveiled in 2020, next slide please, called Slavery in the President's Neighborhood. This site documents the paradoxical relationship between slavery and freedom in the nation's capital and the White House. I encourage you to look, take this site and look at this phenomenal research. So with that, thank you from, from Diana and Nancy and myself, and I believe we are ready for some questions. Terrific, and I'm gonna ask, uh... Everyone to come back on screen here so we can start our Q&A. Uh, again, want to remind everybody in the audience, we're using the um, YouTube chat to ask your questions. I see we've gotten some good ones that have come in. I've got in the queue for you all, but please uh, don't, don't wait. Put your questions in now. And I am uh, delighted to uh, welcome folks from all over the country. We've got uh, Cherry Hill, New Jersey, Poughkeepsie. Uh, Van Wert, Ohio. Actually, we've got several. Toledo, Smithville, Columbus, the land of Taft is well represented. Uh, Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania, Toronto, folks from Frisco and New Braunfels, Texas, uh, Illinois, San Francisco, Asheville, North Carolina, Houston, Texas, not a surprise, Vermont, Maine, Norman, Oklahoma. So thank you, everyone who's, who's joined us from uh, around the country. We, uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of love for the First Ladies and the work that they've done. Uh, these presentations have been very, uh, not just interesting, but enlightening because again, you've sort of unfolded and unpacked some things that, that the media doesn't necessarily focus on, which is terrific. So uh, before we jump into those questions and I wanna let those queue up a little bit, I do wanna ask you, as you all have spent time really studying, uh, studying these women and their legacies, we've spent a lot of time over the last year uh, talking about legacy, legacy of the founders, uh, legacy policies, obviously some of our society, social justice issues. Can you talk, and I'll let you guys decide among yourself who, who wants to jump in first, a little bit about how the First Ladies' um, legacies have changed. Are there specific ones you really think, well, here's one that I think there was a certain perception, and now we think very differently now. Um, Nancy, do you want to jump in? It seemed like you were, you were ready to jump in. I'll be happy to, I'm sure Anita and Diana have a lot to add, but the 
increasingly over time, the importance of a first lady on her own and her legacy has become more and more important. And the, the modern first ladies like Laura Bush, uh, Barbara Bush, Lady Bird Johnson, Rosalind Carter have all left foundations that continue their incredible work. Uh, and I think in, in most, in the last 10 years, there's been a growing group of scholarship, which we want to promote that these women did incredible things on their own, sometimes more important than their, their husbands, uh, being unelected officials, incredible situations. And so that is what all of us are trying to do is focus on their, the incredible achievements these women have made. Sometimes they're uh, mirrors of society and we say sometimes they're leaders and more recently, many of them have been leaders. Mm -hmm. Anita or Diana, do you wanna add? I think the one thing I'd add since I've looked at, at Martha Washington is that these early first ladies really did establish some pieces that have become the legacy of what a first lady does. And, and we've kind of changed our minds about it. You know, Martha had these uh, events every week where her parlor gatherings, uh, Dolly Madison used this. We now call it soft power. And, and we saw examples of that with Lou Henry Hoover, with Marian Anderson. There are so many of those kinds of events. So I think we've changed our minds about what even this soft power or what looks like social activities can do in terms of having an impact societally. But also, you know, Martha be, made it clear that she would be a surrogate for her husband. She attended a funeral when he was sick. Uh, you know, she was concerned about veterans and look how many of our first ladies, including our current one, are concerned about that. So, so there were things that she put in place from the beginning and Abigail Adams and Dolly Madison that continue to this day. Patrick, I think I would just add uh, one thing to Nancy and Diana's, uh, you know, brilliant comments really about framing this and how we look at uh, first ladies and that, you know, in this time that we live in, we're very focused on women's leadership and women's empowerment. And I think throughout history, we can look at each of these women and really do show where they have used their platform to such great effect and using their own experiences and bringing their own authenticity to problems that they choose to engage and really did lead on issues as uh, Nancy has mentioned. But they are women leaders and they are um, even through at time and in different cultural pressures still were empowered um, women uh, to the degree that they could really affect change. Well, we've got a terrific question, which I think segues well into this. Um, how aware were the 20th century first ladies aware of the 19th century first ladies efforts in this area? Well, in terms of Mrs. Johnson, who I knew and worked with, she certainly had a good sense of history. Uh, and she was certainly aware of what had been done. She was a great reader. And I think that's true of the uh, Bushes and Michelle Obama. So I think uh, they had a great sense of history and a strong desire to be themselves, to not follow mm -hmm. in Eleanor Roosevelt's steps or in Lady Bird Johnson's steps, but to be themselves. I'll, I'll see, add, add one thing to that that's actually sort of funny, but if you think about it at the time, it was, could have been considered insulting, but um, this was in 2000 and, you know, George Bush was, um, uh, the, the election was finally decided in one of the early interviews that Laura Bush gave. She was asked by a reporter, which shall remain nameless, are you going to be more like Hillary Clinton or Barbara Bush? And as if she couldn't be herself. And, and her response was very astute. She said, well, I know Laura Bush pretty well, so I'm gonna be her. <laughs> 
and it just uh, again, you know, they 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 know they want to be authentic and what they do, and they are conscious of those that have come before them, of course. But this is their opportunity um, now to uh, to make a difference. Very, very iconic and early quote in the, in their tenure. Uh, that was terrific. So uh, you mentioned along the way. Um, uh, concerns about their their well being as they start to step out on issues. So we've had a couple of questions come in about um, uh, sort of taking op opposite positions to their spouse, and obviously the threats that came with that. So um, Lady Bird uh, Johnson's tour, there were bomb threats. Eleanor, uh, and you can fact check me on this. I'm taking it off our from our viewers. Uh, carried a gun. You know, were, were there, uh, can you talk a little bit more about that very real presence that they were feeling threatened? Patrick Allener did not, to my knowledge, carry a gun. Lou Henry Hoover did carry a gun in the Boxer Rebellion when at, but uh, to my knowledge, Lou uh, Eleanor Roosevelt didn't. But I uh, will pan this question to, uh, Others, Diana, Anita. Well, I, I think especially, you know, when Michelle Obama was very aware of a lot of the threats that both she and her husband were receiving. So I, I and Lady Bird was obviously aware of what was going on with having to have a, an engine precede hers. So, and you look at what the Hoovers went through, uh, you know, those were ugly, ugly letters. Uh, terrible threats uh, to them. So I, I don't think you can be in that position without knowing what's going on, especially currently because it's in the media, uh, gets out. And, and you know we know about it already, even without having the Obama papers open because this was being covered by the news media on some of the threats that, that they encountered. And um, was there a time, and maybe not in the sort of very modern era, but maybe going back into the civil rights sort of period or earlier, where um, the first ladies were maybe discouraged from stepping out and speaking out, whether it be Secret Service or their spouses or others in the administration, where they were saying, hey, maybe you should tamp it down. Or are you aware of any efforts uh, to, to have them sort of dial it back a little bit because of concerns? Well, on the whistle stop trip, mm -hmm. They were very hesitant for Mrs. Johnson to make that. And many people think President Johnson suggested that to her. When I interviewed Mrs. Johnson, Mrs. Johnson picked that trip on her own. And so the Secret Service had to come up with protections. As Diana said, they ran an engine 15 minutes ahead because of the bombing threats. And then Mrs. Johnson will say later on when she gives her Williams speech and her Yale speech on conservation and the environment, and it's later in the administration, uh, 67, early 68, that she will come back and say in her diary that it's very hard for her to go out and deliver her message when there are protests and she wonders she's beginning to get depressed as to whether trying to deliver the message on environment and beautification is being overwhelmed by the message of, hey, hey, how many boys have you killed today and getting out of Vietnam? So certainly there was uh, an angst in her at a certain point as to whether her going out was beneficial or was not. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm Eleanor Roosevelt definitely had uh, some you know individuals in her husband's administration who thought that she was way too public and vocal, uh, but you know he was very supportive of her. I think that is one thing that really does make a difference too mm -hmm. on first ladies. You know what they want to do and what they're able to do, and having the support of of the president makes a big difference. I mean, for example. When Laura Bush went to Afghanistan in 2005, as an active, you know, war zone, um, certainly there were um, uh, threats against our country, threats against uh, the president. But 
uh, her going there was really a courageous uh, act and, you know, had to be planned in, in secret and, and really the dark of night. And, um, but it was important to show, you know, courage and show um, support um, for the people of Afghanistan who were trying to climb out of, you know, a terrible uh, situation. And you knew that, you know, the dangers of the Taliban were still very much around. That's a good, good perspective. Um, and I appreciate that. This is why we have always have historians on to correct the record. Um, so I have some specific questions about specific first lady so we can sort of uh, make our way through uh, this. Uh, Ellen Wilson's efforts, uh, were they shaped uh, or vary from uh, the fact that President Wilson was openly racist or the policies were sort of obviously skewed in a very specific way? Um, can in, any of you talk to um, sort of her, her positions? Yeah, I don't know that she was you know, directly doing this as a result of that. But, you know, a lot of it was once again, her background. And, uh, you know, she grew up in the South. She'd come from a background, like I said, of slave owning families. You know, she was very, very well educated. She was an artist, incredible woman, uh, very accomplished in her own right. And, you know, this was just something that was part of who she was from her background. And I, I doubt that it, uh, you know, had a lot to do with trying to counter his position. And Anita, Nancy, you may know a little more about Edith than that, or Ellen than that. I think that is a good answer. Okay. Um, what about uh, fast forwarding uh, to uh, Rosalind Carter or Hillary Clinton? Did they have any initiatives that you might want to touch on in regard okay. to this area? Well, I'd love to uh, touch on Mrs. Uh, Carter, um, uh, of course, because, you know, her passion uh, and commitment to mental health issues in this mm -hmm. country really was a game, a game changer. And, you know, as first lady of Georgia, you know, she chaired the governor's commission, you know, on, on mental health. And that this was you know, such an important issue because of the stigma associated uh, with it. And then treatment and uh, diagnosis uh, really needing to come out in the open. And then when she came to Washington and she fully intended to be engaged in this issue and President Carter, you know, of course supported her work and um, uh, named the commission, the President's Commission on Mental Health and wanted her to chair it. But the um, personnel laws at the time really prevented the first lady from being able to, um, for the president to actually have a member of his family uh, be employed, if you will. So it caused you know, a whole number of changes and a new personnel authorization act for the White House that um, had to define now a structure around the office of the first lady that really had not existed before. So Mrs. Carter had great impact not only on the issue of mental health, because she did serve in that capacity as honorary chair of the President's Commission on Mental Health, but she had a longstanding impact on how the structure of a modern First Lady's office has been able to operate since that time. And Hillary Clinton, uh, as a governor's wife of Arkansas, pushed hugely for uh, bettering education, for uh, particularly for minorities. She was very interested in that. And then, of course, when she was first lady, she, uh, as did uh, Laura Bush, got to the larger international scale in terms of human rights and is known for her fa famous comment at the Beijing conference, which is human rights are women's rights and women's rights are human rights. So we just did a sampling of first ladies because of time. We are not saying these are the only first ladies who did things for civil rights. Of course, of course. Well, I, I always, when we have these conversations, I, I lose track of time. So we have just a little bit of, we're going a little over, but that's okay. I've, I've got two questions. I, 
I feel like I need to ask. So we have a second gentleman and I want to ask you all, how do you see um, roles changing? First ladies, second gentlemen's, first gentlemen's. What do we think? Well, you know, I, I'll just very briefly say, and I'm sure the others want to add on this. You know, the country keeps marching on and we keep changing. And this is a new chapter now in our history. And it helps people become more, you know, comfortable with the fact that these this role will change. And, and Dr. Biden has changed the role as first lady, is now a full-time, you know, working first lady outside the home. It's a lot to balance. But she has great experience of having done it as the second lady uh, of the land already. And I may add, you know, uh, Lynn Cheney also was full time working second lady as well as a fellow at American Enterprise Institute. So um, now that, you know, there's a, a man as the sec second gentleman who also holds a job outside the home, but wants to be supportive of his wife. He, he is invested in her success the way first ladies through our history have been invested in their husband's success. So I think it's a, it's an equalizer in a way, in a manner of speaking. Well, and we have a lot of models at the state level. You know, this yes. is new at the, at the national level, but it certainly has been going on for 40 years at the state level. Right. And, you know, those roles have been balanced and, you know, the world doesn't come to an end if you have a husband who has a full-time job, you know, those other right. kinds of things continue. So I think that's a little of what we're saying. But I, I, I think also the point that Anita made about Dr. Biden and, and Lynn Cheney is that this is the reality of, of our, you know, family structures now. And the, the White House has always in many ways represented, we've, we've looked at it as sort of models of American families, and we've had a lot of different structures. And so this is just kind of, I think, finally catching up with where we've been for the last 40 years. And I like what Hillary Clinton in the 2016 campaign said, someone asked her, well, what would you call Bill Clinton? And she goes, first dude. <laughs> so I, I, I like that, you know, the first dude. <laughs> but, there you go. We'll have to, have to see if folks uh, get comfortable with that, right? Uh, yeah. And in many ways, the United States is catching up. There's been many other countries, obviously, with women as, right. as the top uh, elected official. So uh, we'll get there. We will get there. Well, I have one closing question. Obviously, you all are a wealth of knowledge. I know you're collaborating. And so I'd love to know, and I want to share with the viewers, um, what else is coming up? Are the things that our audience should be aware of that you all are working on that you'd like yeah. to share before we close out? Yes. So we'll be together again on May 6th. In fact, we have a little slide here um, for you. The uh, American University, the First Ladies Initiative that I direct and the White House Historical Association are hosting a symposium on First Ladies on May 6th. You can see the link there to find more information. I, I think the registration will go out soon, um, but it's a uh, all day virtual symposium. Diana will be presenting, Nancy will be presenting, and uh, also a host of, of uh, other First Lady authors and scholars, biographers uh, through the sweep of history. And we'll look at one of the topics you had mentioned uh, Patrick earlier that we look at first ladies differently and some of the first ladies reconsidered is one of the panels. Um, the other thing that you mentioned for us, so thank you very much, is the First Ladies Association for Research and um, Education. As you see here, FLAIR, this is our logo, was formed in 2020. Three, the three of us here are three of the seven founders uh, and we want this to be the primary um, association to encourage the, the study and collaboration around the uh, first ladies, the biographers, archivists, ladies, first lady staff, journalists, uh, really who are interested in the research um, and the education about the lasting legacy of first ladies. So more to come on that. It's affiliated with American University, but more will be uh, coming soon, right, Diana and Nancy? Yes. Yes, we are about to, to launch. So and terrific. Well, so folks only need to wait a couple of weeks to catch you all yeah. in action again. 
Excellent. Excellent. I'm sure you'll be busy between now and then. Well, I really appreciate the foundation. Obviously, all of on behalf of our viewers, appreciate you sharing your, your knowledge, your wisdom, and insight on the First Ladies on this topic. Very timely. And, and uh, as you mentioned, more to come uh, in the coming weeks with the symposium. So thank you for your time. We've got a couple of, I have a couple of closing announcements. So I'll say uh, uh, goodbye to you at this point and, uh, and thank you. And hopefully we'll have you on again another time so we can get an update. There's plenty to dig into when you're talking about the first ladies. I know that. Thank you. So thank, you. thank you thank so you. much. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Hi. And so for our, uh, our viewers, I just want to say thank you. Uh, appreciate all of those of you who are supporting us by by uh, joining us for these programs, of course, our sponsors uh, of Rightfully Hers, American Women in the Vote, which is a major initiative of the National Archives and the Foundation to celebrate the 19th Amendment. It continues, even though the museum is still closed, we're continuing to, to celebrate that, as well as all of our members and corporate supporters and donors. Uh, if it wasn't for them, we would not have made it through all of this that we've been living through for the last year. If you're not a member of the foundation, you can join us by visiting our website, archivesfoundation.org. Our museum has not reopened yet, but the National Archives still has one of the hottest museums, uh, museum shops online. I hope you'll uh, come by and, and pick up some of our cherry blossom gear. And Mother's Day is just around the corner. Uh, you can visit the best gift shop in DC online at nationalarchivesstore.org. And don't miss our upcoming program. Got a couple things coming up. Now on April 14th, we've got our Presidential Library Series. We'll be visiting College Station and the George H.W. Bush Presidential Library. And then later in the month, uh, we will be having a program on April 29th that's uh, continuing to talk about First Ladies, how they have uh, broke from tradition and changed the role. So I hope you'll join us for that. And we are cooking some really interesting things in May and June. So uh, you can always check us out on our website, uh, obviously follow us on social media for updates as well. The National Archives is our nation's memory. What is past is prologue. So on behalf of the National Archives Foundation, thank you for joining us today.